and well, let's be part of that tonight and uh, let's, prog- let's have some progress in the kingdom of God. If you're here for that, say amen. I want to turn your attention to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Please take a Bible out and grab one off the tables, grab one off the backs of the pews, wherever you are. Grab one of those if you have your own, that's awesome. If you don't own one, take the one out of the pew or off the table and Take it with you. That's our gift to you. I want to say hello to those that are watching on Facebook. I noticed when I was back there, there was quite a few people watching. So welcome you to our sanctuary online, if you will, and our our extended family. Um, Thank you again for uh, all those that helped today with Quarter Mania. And I want to reiterate the importance of tomorrow. Uh, Our church will only be as strong as the commitment level of those who are already here. And so if you want your church to be awesome, it must include, point to that person, you, you, absolutely. So uh, please be here, uh, the, the, the rev in the rev group revved before uh, Karen could tell you that we're going to serve you pizza tomorrow as, as well. So, you know, you don't have to leave church tomorrow morning and run to Golden Corral. You can just stay right here and we'll feed you. So... We're going to lay before you every, every awesome opportunity you have to serve. So that being said, uh, we want to progress. So what I want to do is I want to read this, this to you. We're going, to, we're going to jump into God's Word pretty heavy again tonight, and, and I hope you're excited about that. I, I want to commend those that are actually here, a real light group here tonight. Everyone was too wimpy to get out because they thought they might melt, I guess. The rain scared them away. So hoorah for you guys that toughed it out in this just brutal, brutal drizzle and uh, chose to come to God's house and hear God's word and sing God's praises. And so I commend you for that, and I know that God is pleased. So um, here is 2 Peter chapter 1. Look in verse um, 3. We're going to start there, and we're just going to read a, a couple of verses, about five verses. It says this, By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Um, for all those that are waiting on the Lord, listen to what was just read. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share in His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond. Say respond. Okay, that's the word right there. That's called progress. Respond. You don't just come in and say, hey, good, good message, preacher. That really hit me where it needed to. No, we are supposed to respond to what you hear. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. And then there's sort of a list here. Um, not so much that we need to read those in detail tonight, but just breezing through them. Supplement your faith with the generous provision of moral excellence, moral excellence with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with patient endurance, patient endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love for who? Everyone. Look, the more you grow like this, I don't know, I'm just, I'm reading this, and I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm thinking, you know, God really wants us to respond. He wants us to, something should happen. When you come here and you hear this, something should happen inside of you. There should be some results. There should be some response. Look at it says, the more you grow, that, that implies change, doesn't it? You know, where you were, you grew. Uh, uh, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you'll be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me just ask you guys a question. Just kind of show of hands. How many people want to be more productive for the Lord? Everyone in this room. It's amazing. Look at that. Awesome. Mike wants to be productive for him and his wife. He's got both hands up. That's a good husband. Well, that's the whole, that's the whole purpose here of this series called Faithful. We want to respond like something should happen as a result of studying the faithfulness of God. As we go through the series, we're supposed to be changing. We're supposed to live differently, right? We live with faith because we look back and we see promise fulfillment, promise fulfillment, promise fulfillment, right? We can walk forward in confidence because we can look back and see consistency. 
We could see what God has done time and time again in the past to come through and keep His Word. And so, because we see that He keeps His Word, we know that we can walk forward in confidence, knowing that He'll continue to keep His Word because He is the Lord and He does not change. Because He's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we see that He makes these, great, He calls them great and precious promises. You know, the one, the one promise I know, I, I can tell, I can tell right now, like, I'm, I'm try, I, maybe it's the reason why our church isn't as big and full as it, as it could be, but, but I'm just, I, I, don't, I, don't hold, I don't care what anyone thinks, right? I, I'm just telling you the truth. I look here right now, right, and I see, it's Saturday night, we've been going for eight years, and I see these, listen, I'm happy. People say, oh, what's wrong with you, Priya? Let me just tell you right in advance. I'm happy. I'm happy. We had a great day today. Everything's good. I spent good time with the Lord early before I came out here. I am in a great mood. I am happy. I just want to tell you something. When I see this, when I see a bunch of empty seats, something stirs inside of me. I see something and I just like, I don't, I don't know if people get this. There's this big promise that looms over all people. And when I look here, I think, man, I don't think people are getting it. It's that one in Matthew 6 where he says, I know all that you need. And if you make seeking me and advancing my kingdom your priority, I'll take care of everything that you need. And what I see here is I don't see people responding to that great and precious promise. I see people caving and they're not doing that. I think that if everyone truly, honestly believed that, that if they sought the Lord with everything they had, that He would take care of their needs, I think they'd be here right now. Amen. I think they'd be in church on Saturday. I think they'd be in church on Sunday. I think they'd be volunteering. When everyone said, hey, we're going to advance the gospel in this way, we're going to just have this project, you'd be there. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put that second or third on the list. That would be the number one, because that's what He says. If you make me, Jesus Christ, central in your life, advancing the kingdom within you, like coming after me and learning and growing and, and seeking to advance the kingdom outwardly to other people, if you make that the number one thing, I'll take care of everything you need. Like if, you, if, 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 there, if there was someone, I'm going to hammer this point down. If, if, if Bill Gates came up to you and said, this is what happens when you sit in the front row. He said, Miss Paula, if you study your Bible for two hours a day and you go to church every weekend and on Sunday night, man, that guy Jay, he's a nice fella and he's doing this, 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 this Bible study in the Gospel of John. If you go to that thing, if you do that, I'll give you $5,000 a week. Let me ask you a question. I'm putting you on the spot here, sister. And you represent everyone in the Christian church across the country. Sign here. How many people, percentage-wise, do you think would sign that? 90%? I mean, there's some people that are rich and they're making more than that. That would be a cut and pay. Now, Mr. Trump might not, he just gave away his salary. So that might not work for him. You know what I mean? But for most people, they'd sign that, right? And I'm telling you right now, as sure as I'm standing here, that God has filled out that contract for you. And you refuse to sign it. And everyone who's watching right now, you refuse to sign it because you don't believe it. And that's what we're looking for. That's why we gather here every week so that God can build your faith so you can trust Him in that, over, that looming promise that's over everyone's life. But let me ask you a question. Do you have a pen with you? You got a pen? You got a pen. Okay, you got a pen. Take a second and write down. Do this, please. Write down the one thing. There's something, right? Everyone's got it. Everyone's got one thing that God has promised either in your word or someone spoke over your life or you heard it in a song or you read it in the Bible and you knew that God promised this but you're struggling with it and you want him to come through for you. It's a want, right? Might not be a need, but you want it. You want it, you want it. Just raise your hand if you have something. Does everyone have something? Be honest right now, okay? Jot it down. Write it down. Write it down. Don't, stand, don't sit there and look at me. It's not going to help you. I can't help you. I'm not the one who made the promise. Because he said he knows your needs. He knows your needs. And if you'll put him first, 
he'll take care of it. And that one thing is what he's going after tonight. That thing. It might not be other stuff, but that one thing he's going after. He said, I will provide those things, right? I will. That's what he says. God says, I will. He says, I will all the time. He's got all kinds of I wills, I wills, I wills. I will. Lots of people say I will, but most people don't ever follow through with the I will. They, they talk about the I will, the thing in the future, but the I will most often doesn't transition to I was or I did. You know, I said I was going to, but I didn't really do it. And God's not like that. 1 uh, Corinthians 1.9, I am faithful to do what I say. Remember it says, for, for my name's sake, in Isaiah he says that. And for my name's sake, I, I'm not willing to, to let myself be denied. I cannot deny myself. I will not let my reputation be tarnished. I'm going to do these things because I said that's what I'm going to do. Yesterday, today, and forever, I never change. I'm looking for faithfulness. And faithfulness being the constant, the consistent pattern of reliability displayed over time. That's what we're shooting for. And that's what God is showing us through this study. And so we could count on him more. We could trust him more. And that's what he wants. Listen, I'm not here to just yell at you about it. I want you to walk out of here with a greater faith. I want you to walk out of here trusting that when he says, I'll take care of everything you need, if you put me first, that you will put him first. And as each person starts to put him first, one more at a time, one more brick in the wall, you're going to see his church build to be a monster that has to be reckoned with. Right? That's what he needs. He needs people to go all in. So we're going to study some of these I wills. Just three of them tonight. Just three. Three, three I wills. So do me a favor and turn first to uh, Matthew chapter 20. Please put your eyes on God's word. Don't just sit and listen to me. Matthew chapter 20. Four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the first book in the New Testament. You can go there, chapter 20. You guys all there? Awesome. Who believes God's word when he says that faith comes from hearing the word of God? That you're going to hear the word of God and your faith will be built tonight. Do you believe it? Okay, awesome. Because you're about to hear the word of God. Does it matter how you feel? Does it matter what you think? No. Okay, God's, God's word, God has the power. You don't. God doesn't. When he says that faith comes from hearing the word of God, faith comes from hearing the word of God. Here it comes. You ready? Here it's coming at you. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. That's tough right there. That's bold. Uh, this is what's going to happen. You've got to remember something. What's about to happen involves people that are not on his team. He can't tell them in his humanity, hey, I need you to do this for me. Because they would have said what? Oh, hell no. Right? I'm against you. I'm your enemy. I'm not doing as you say. So he's about to say what's about to happen to him, and it involves people that are not under his humanity influence. And so this is what he says. Listen, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man, that's what he called himself, will be betrayed by the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die then they will hand him over to the Romans, the Gentiles. They go hand in hand. Romans, Gentiles. There's, there's two groups of people in this world according to the Jewish people. There's Jewish people and then there's other. The other is Gentile. Okay? Just so you understand a little, little, little Jewish stuff there for you. Okay? So, and, and, the, and the center of the, of the known world, Rome was the epicenter of all Gentiles. Right? So you're going to be betrayed you're going to be sentenced to die. Then they will hand you over to the Gentiles, the Romans, to be mocked, flogged with a whip. That's whipped. Crucified. But on the third day, this is going to be a good place for any man. He will be raised from the dead. Okay, awesome. Okay. So, so you can see there in, in the text, you can see it all right there, that there's seven I wills. There are seven I wills. Betrayed, sentenced, handed over to Rome, the Gentiles, mocked, whipped, crucified and raised. I will be, I will be. Seven things. What, listen, last week we talked about what are the chances that, this, that a person could fulfill eight prophecies. And it was one silver dollar out of 
36.8 billion acres across the earth. That's how much land mass there is that's exposed over water. And if you took gold, silver coins and piled them 120 feet deep across the entire 36.8 billion acres and, and put one black mark on one and said to a blindfolded guy, now find that one, that's the chances of this happening. So in this one sentence, he says, this is what's going to happen. Seven things. Seven things. Betrayed, sentenced handed over to Rome, mocked, whipped, crucified, and raised. What's the chances of this happening? So he said, I will. That speaks to the future, right? This is what's going to happen. Well, we're talking tonight about I wills moving to I was. This speaks of the past. This says, I look back and I say, listen, I said this was going to happen. I said I was going to do this, and I was, and I did. It actually happened. And so I don't want to make a claim about Jesus. That's what we're here for, right? We're here to make claims about Jesus. We're here to, to tell you all how awesome Jesus is. But I don't want to make a claim without you personally seeing that claim fulfilled in God's Word. So I want you to humor me here, and we're going to dive through the Scriptures here, and we're going to see where the I will actually became an I was. Okay? So Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Fourteen through sixteen. The first one is I be, I, I'll be, he'll be betrayed. I will be betrayed. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests. He asked, "How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you?" And they gave him thirty pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Forty-seven through fifty. That same chapter. 47 through 50. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor Judas had, been, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. I was betrayed. I will be betrayed. I was betrayed. I will be sentenced. I was sentenced. Mark 26, verse 63. Then the high priest stood up. I'm sorry, 63. But Jesus remained silent after being asked about the charges against him. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus replied, you have said it, and in the future you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show his horror and said, blasphemy, why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they shouted. He deserves to die, sentenced. I was handed over to Rome. I will be handed over. I was handed over. Mark 15. Mark 15, 1. Just walking through the scriptures is all we're doing. Mark 15, 1. Very early in the morning the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire Sanhedrin, the high council, the Jewish authority. They met to discuss the next step. They had arrested him. What do we do now? Here's their decision. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. I will be handed over to Rome. I was handed over to Rome. I will be whipped, Luke 23, 13. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man ha has done calls for the death penalty, so I'll have him flogged. 
I will have him whipped, and then I'll release him. Why is an innocent man being whipped? Because I said I will be. That's why. Verse 22 through 24. For the third time he demanded, Pilate, why? What crime has he committed? The people are screaming for his death, screaming for, crucify him, crucify him, kill him, kill him. Why? He says, why? I've, I've, he's done nothing. I found no reason to sentence him to death. So I'll have him whipped. He's innocent, but yet he's being whipped. Why? Because he said, I'll be whipped. And he's faithful to his word. That's what he said would happen, and so it did. I will be mocked. The following is a, is a, a collection of all the mockery in all the Gospels, too many to list. It says that these are the things that were said of him, uh, to him. If you're the king of the Jews, then save yourself. They dressed him in a purple robe, mocking him, put a crown of thorns on his head, saluted him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck him on the head with a reed stick, spit on him, then dropped to their knees in mock worship. They said, Ha! Look at you now! Save yourself and come down from the cross! What is all this? Mockery. Mockery. I will be mocked. I was mocked. I will be crucified. Luke 23, 13, when they came to the place named the Skull, Golgotha, the place called Calvary. They nailed him to the cross. I will be crucified. I was crucified. And on the cross I said, it is finished. It is finished. And yes, maybe the work of, of paying for your sin was finished on the cross. But his work wasn't finished yet. And because he was in that grave and he got a little uncomfortable in there, right? And he can't let anything be more powerful than him. And he can't be put to death. Right? Nothing could, could, can be more powerful than me. So he got a little uneasy up in there, right? And the ground started to tremble, and the, ro the rock was rolled away, and he came out of the grave. He can't lose, right? He can't lose. And so the next thing is, I will raise. Yes, Luke 24, 1 through 7. What does it say? But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in. But they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they looked there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? Like he told you this was going to happen. Listen, just as you don't trust him with all of your needs, they didn't trust him either. It's a universal problem. Everyone's got it. It's called sin. We're, 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 we are infected with it. And he's here today. He's meeting you here in his word, by his spirit, to build your faith and get rid of that sin. And these people, they were doubting and doubting and doubting. But why are you looking for someone who's not here? He's risen from the dead. Remember when he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and crucified and that he would rise again on the third day? Don't you remember? Then they remembered, ah, that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. I was raised and then... He appears to the two in the road to Emmaus, raised from the dead, and then he appears to, 12, uh, to 11 disciples, raised from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. He appears to over 500 people. And the amazing thing is that six out of these seven things, he actually, as a human, didn't do. Just think about that. He made seven claims of what will happen. And in his humanity, he didn't have anything to do with six of them. But yet they still happened. Unwilling participants find themselves willing to subject themselves to Jesus' plan, even though they didn't understand why they were doing it. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what are the chances of this actually happening? Have him uh, fulfilling all seven things. What's the chances of this happening? What's the chances of him being raised from the dead? Like you've all heard that Jesus raid, raised Lazarus from the dead. You guys hear that one? Right, so here's Lazarus. That, and, and just think about that. Like how cool is that? That Jesus can extend his power to the powerless. Like here's this guy who's powerless, right? He's dead. 
Guy's dead in a tomb, in a, like a cave with a rock, just kind of like what Jesus, he's in this tomb, he's dead, and he's been dead for a couple of days. Like, he's super dead. And, and Jesus has this, I mean, this is epic, right? This is what movies are made out of. Why don't they make a movie out of this? So he, he extends his power to the powerless. That's, I mean, that's totally awesome. But, but listen, here, here's the deal with the dead guy, right? You, not to be, like, gross, but, like, when you die, you, so your heart stops beating, right? And when your heart stops beating, you don't get blood and oxygen and stuff. Like, your organ, you start to, like, your, your brain dies. You know what I'm saying? Like, everything starts to turn off and die and rot. So, so, so and have you ever heard of the, the death chill? Do you guys know what the death chill is? You guys all know about that? You don't know about the death? I didn't know about the death chill either. The death chill is this, kind of gross, but the death chill means that after you die, that your body starts to go down in temperature. It's about a degree and a half every hour until it reaches room temperature. That's the death chill. Now think about this, though. Cold, dark tomb. That's cold. Like when I went up to South Carolina a couple months back, we went up to the mountains there. We went up to the, on, that, on that nice drive up the mountains. We went to that, the pretty place. You guys remember the picture I put up there? So we're going up there. There's this place where we could get out of the car and you could kind of climb out onto the cliffs and you could see everything. It was a little bit chilly that morning, but I mean, that wasn't like crazy freezing, you know? I had like a little light, like a sweatshirt on. But there was this place called like the Devil's Kitchen. And, 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 and you climb down through the rocks, down into the rocks, down deep in here. It's like these little crevices through the rocks and so I was up there and I had a little sweatshirt on I was down in the rocks and there were icicles hanging off that just shows you the like so we just want to get an idea of what it's like inside the cold tomb of Lazarus the death chill and then within three hours of death rigor mortis starts to set in you know it starts with your eyelids because they're thin and weak so they get stiff. Your eyes are open, they stay open. They're closed, they stay closed. And then it starts to lower down through your body. Starts here and starts to lower down until everything is rock solid stiff. It's kind of gross. And then you know that you have, like, like your guts are super, super filled with bacteria. Did you know that? Did you know that? Like to, to digest food, right? Yeah, so when you're dead, your immune system is dead and everything else that would defend against the bacteria is dead. So guess what your bacteria starts to do? Eat you. This is what's going on inside of the dead person, right? That's what's going on inside the dead person. So can, you, can we all agree at least like that this person who would be in that situation, they're in a pretty bad place, right? Super, super bad place. So why don't we do this? Why don't we make a list of the things that that guy can do? It, it, would, be a, it would be a short list, a way short list of the things that that guy could do. Like what's the one thing that that guy could do? Nothing. That's, that's what that guy can do, right? So, so how does a cold, stiff, decaying person have the power to raise himself from the tomb? Right? How can he, how, what's the chances of I will transitioning to I was when you're cold and dead and powerless unless, unless the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in you? Unless you were God's plan and you were God's promise. Maybe then it would happen, right? And so if God can do that, if he can extend power from his own self of powerless humanity and somehow raise himself from the dead. How about your thing? That should be sufficient, but I know that it's not. So go to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, super famous section of scripture. You guys have all heard of Paul. If you've never been to church before, love you. You're about to hear about him. Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. What does it say here? Verse 15 and 16. Now, but the Lord said, go. He's talking to Ananias, the guy who was supposed to pray with this guy, Saul, who was going around killing Christians, but God had saved him and now... He wants to use him. He would say the same thing to you. He saved you to use you. And so Ananias is going to go pray for this guy. And then Paul is going to start his mission, his, his mission for the Lord. And so he says to this guy, Ananias, he's a little bit scared because, you know, Paul likes to kill people. He's got this little problem. And so he's a little bit nervous. But he's like, yeah, go, go for Saul as my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles. That's Rome. 
and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. So Jews, Jews and Gentiles, like basically the world, right? And I will show, here it is, I will. You see it there? You see the I will? Okay. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So there's another precious and great promise. I will show Paul how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That's the promise. Here's the process. The process, why? Because he's my chosen instrument to bring the gospel to Rome and to the ends of the earth, basically, because it's Jews and Gentiles alike. This is what I'm going to do with Paul, and I'm going to show him how much he's going to have to suffer to do this. So let me just see here. Again, I don't want to make a claim without letting you lay your eyes on God's word to see what it really is. And so here, here's some verses for you. You don't have to, to go there, but you can jot them down if you want to read them later. So I will show, here's the promise. I will show Paul how much he must suffer for my namesake. Chapter 9, verse 23, some Jews in Damascus plotted together to kill him. Chapter 9, verse 29, some Jews in Jerusalem tried to murder him. Got out of that one, got out of that one. Chapter 13, 49 through 50, they're in Antioch of Pisidia, right, which is like northern Mediterranean, like where modern-day Turkey would be now. And it says that there was a mob that gathered, you're going to see that a lot, that gathered and kind of run him out of town. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 5, he, there, he's in Iconium, and there's a mo another mob. They decide to stone Paul. Gets out of that one. Chapter 14, verse 19, he's in Lystra, and they did stone Paul and left him for dead. Got out of that one. Chapter 16, verse 22, a mob, another mob. What's with this guy? A mob in Philippi forms, and, he and, he and they have the authorities strip Paul down naked, beat him with a, like a, a broomstick, a wooden rod, and put him in prison. Gets out of that one. Chapter 19, it says that the entire city of Ephesus, the entire city of Ephesus was in an uproar, a riot against Paul. They wanted to kill him. Got out of that one. Chapter 20, verse 3. There's a planned assassination against Paul on the ship that he was going to board to go from Macedonia to Syria. Gets out of that one, right? In verse, chapter 21, ch check up chapter 21, verse 27 through 30. I'm going to read that one. 27 through 30. Seven days were almost ended when some Jews from the province, these Jews, man, province of Asia saw Paul in the temple and roused a mob against him. They grabbed him, yelling, Men of Israel, help us! This is the man who preaches against our people everywhere and tells everybody to disobey the Jewish laws. He speaks against the temple. He even defies this holy place by bringing in Gentiles. The whole city was rocked by these accusations, and a great riot followed. Paul was grabbed and dragged out of the temple, and immediately the gates were closed behind him. As they were trying to kill him, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment that all Jerusalem, all Jerusalem, like there's a ton of people, it's not like Paisley. All of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately called out his soldiers and officers and ran down among the crowd. When the mob saw the commander and the troops coming, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander, uh, listen, <laughs> this is crazy. They're beating this guy, and they go in and arrest him. Like, what is up with this? They go in and they arrest Paul. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. He asked, arrest him and ordered him bound with chain, two chains. He asked the crowd who, what, who he was and what he had done. Some shouted one thing and some another. Since he couldn't find out the truth in all the uproar and confusion, he ordered that Paul was taken to the fortress. As Paul reached the stairs, look, picture this in your mind. The mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift him to their shoulders to protect him, and the crowd followed behind shouting, Kill him! Kill him! And he gets out of this one. Like, what's the chances of dodging all this stuff? What's the chance? I mean, you think you had a tough day? I had a tough day. I, I, did, look at what's going on in this guy's life. Mob after mob, stoned, beaten, imprisoned, whipped. Certainly God kept his word that he's going to show Paul how much he's going to have to suffer for his namesake, didn't he? But why did Paul make it through all this stuff? 
That's the question you got to ask. Because God said Paul is his chosen instrument to bring the message to the Gentiles. So he couldn't die yet. No matter what they did, he wasn't going to die until that message got to Rome. It doesn't matter what they tried. It doesn't matter how many swords. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what they do. He can't die because God said he's the one who's going to go to the epicenter of the Gentile world and bring my gospel there. That's why. Because if you get the gospel to Rome, you get the gospel to the world. And he's going to send him there. That's why. So let, let's just, because that wasn't bad enough, let, let's just keep going. In, in chapter 22, verse 24, it says that the Jewish leaders, they have Paul lashed with whips. And, and in response to that, he yells out that he's a Roman citizen. So now begins the process of Paul actually making his way to Rome to fulfill what God had said that he's going to be the one to preach to the Romans. Chapter 23, verse 12, a group of 40 Jews, right? Not one or two, not five or ten, 40 people. Listen, this is what they did. This is awesome. You know what the Bible says when you really need something of God, like when you're really getting after it in prayer? Do you know that you're supposed to fast, right? Fasting, that's something we don't do in the church. Well, you're supposed to fast. Like, like, Lord, I need something really, really bad. Like, really bad, I need to hear from you. I really need a breakthrough in my life. Listen, you know what you do? You fast. You starve your flesh. You say this message to God. God, I really need you, and I really want you to work boldly in this thing for me. And so I starve myself. I know it sounds crazy, but that's what we do. We stop eating. And we say, God, I don't need this food. I don't need this entertainment. I don't need these people. I need you so bad. That's what you do when you, when you fast. And it said that these 40 Jews actually started fasting. They were so passionate about killing this guy that they began to fast and make a commitment. All right, guys, we are, we're going to ask the Lord to help us kill this guy. And we're, and we're going to make a commitment, and we're not, listen, we're not going to give up until he's dead. Like, that's how bad of an opposition this guy has to reaching Rome with the gospel. And he escapes that one, too. Verse, uh, chapter 27, Paul is a prisoner on a ship heading to Rome. And the ship is going to shipwreck because it hasn't been bad enough yet. He hasn't suffered enough yet. And so he's on a ship on the way to Rome and, the sh and there's a massive storm and the storm is going to shipwreck the boat. And back in the day, if you're a Roman soldier, if your prisoner escapes, you don't want to go back to Rome. Because if you go back to Rome you get the penalty that they were going to get. You let your prisoner escape, you might as well drive a sword through your chest because it's coming anyway. So what are the, 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 the guards on the ship, before the shipwreck comes, before this big storm breaks up the boat, they're thinking, listen, if this storm breaks the boat apart and, these, and we all go into the water, if any of these, Jewish, any of these prisoners escape, we're dead, so we need to kill them all before the shipwreck comes. And the commander steps in and says, no, don't do that. That's what their normal practice was. But the commander somehow, some way, why? He says, no, don't do that because <laughs> he needs to get to Rome. And the ship breaks apart in the storm. And the people are out in the water. And they're doggy paddling their way back to shore. And in, in chapter 28, they, they, the ship comes apart, and they finally get to shore, and they crawl up onto the shore. Can you just, you've seen the movies, right? And they crawl up onto the shore, and they're, you know, they're kissing the ground. Oh, I made it. Thank you, right? And he crawls up on the shore, and he's like, oh, I made it, I made it. And he, and he gets bit by a poisonous snake. Hey! And he still lives. Why? What's the chances? What's the chances of this happening? Don't forget 2 Peter. God's great and precious promises, listen, enable you to escape 
the world's corruption caused by human desires. <laughs> Don't you just love when God's word actually comes to life exactly as it is written? That is insane. And if he can do that, what about your one thing that you wrote down? <sighs> Acts 28, you see verses 30 and 31. The gospel as promised by God is now preached to the Gentile Romans by Paul. It actually happened. He dodges all these bullets, mobs and whips and beaten and jail and shipwrecks and prisoner and snake bites that should kill you and all of this. And he dodges it all and he is, he's actually there in Rome preaching to the Gentiles. What's the chances of this happening? And it's here in Rome that the church actually explodes and launches into this worldwide mission. The, the Roman Empire was the largest concentration of people on the earth at the time. Upwards of 90 million people there. And the gospel has now invaded the Roman Empire. Awesome. And here's the crazy thing. Fast forward to the year 380. And the Roman emperor, Theodosius I, he makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's crazy. Like, that's a big win, right? But stop for a second and think about this. Rome, was they were the ones who actually killed Jesus. And now, this emperor is telling his people, no, you have to worship the dead guy, the guy we killed. You have to worship him now. He's alive. Like, you, you, you got to worship. It's not, before we'll kill him, now you have to worship him. This is insanity. It wasn't some other nation's thing. It was that it happened right there with the ones who killed him. And now they're insisting that you worship him like, What's the chances of this actually happening? Unless, of course, there's a power at work here that is transcending the power of the Roman Empire and its emperor. And if God could keep Paul alive through all of this and get him to Rome to preach and convert the entire empire, how about your one thing? Doesn't seem so big anymore, does it? Do you feel your one thing getting increasingly small? I hope that you are. That's the reason that we're here tonight. That's what God wanted to invade, that thing. So it would get very, very small in the presence of a very, very big God. So why all this with Paul? Why does Rome go the way of Jesus? I'll tell you why. Look up here. Because 350 years before, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who the scripture says everything was created by him and for him. He made a great and precious promise. And it's in Matthew 16, 18. He said, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not stop it. That's why it happened. That's why it happened. Rome thought they could stop it, and they couldn't. The religious leaders thought they could stop it on the cross. They thought he was dead. That's awesome. They couldn't stop it. Death and the grave and hell itself thought they could stop him. And when he's on the cross and says it's finished, they're probably clapping their hands, but they couldn't stop it. And it's still going. Remember, God cannot deny himself. He will not let his name equal failure. So for his own namesake, he will always keep his word all the time. It starts with the 12. He says, I'm going to build my church, and hell will not stop it. And then it spreads to the Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost, where it's about 120 people. And the church has grown now. And then in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, it says all the believers met together in church, and then they met in homes and rev groups. And they built each other up and they studied God's word and they worshiped and they broke bread and they prayed. 
And every day the Lord added to the church those that were being saved. It's spreading, it's spreading, it's spreading. And so as they're gathering there in Acts chapter 2, you can see the Lord growing his church in the gathering. His promises being fulfilled in the gathering of the saints. And the promise continues in the scattering of the saints. In the mid-400s A.D., St. Patrick, who was born in Britain and sold into slavery as a youngster in Ireland, he escapes slavery, he takes off back to Europe, he studies the scriptures, and then he goes back to Ireland to start evangelizing the island. And so spreads Christianity. In the late 500s, early church leader Augustine is sent as a missionary to England, and he was blessed to baptize, they believe, thousands of new converts to Christianity. So spreads Christianity to England. In 496, French king Clovis I converts from paganism to Roman Catholicism, and he insists that all of his nobles follow suit. So spreads Christianity to France. In 698, a monk named St. Wilberbroad is sent to establish the church in the Netherlands. Promise fulfillment. Promise fulfillment. Ansgar, the Archbishop of Bremen, begins to evangelize Denmark and Sweden in around 820 A.D. So it goes. Around the year 988, missionaries led by Patriarch Photius, they begin evangelizing the Ukraine, Bulgaria, and Russia. And of course, we're more familiar with this in 1492, what? Columbus sailed the ocean blue. They come over here in 1607, Jamestown, the first colony, is planted. And Christianity begins to spread throughout North America. And as of right now, there's approximately 384 Christian, 384,000 Christian churches in the United States of America and an estimate of 37 million churches worldwide preaching and teaching Jesus. Today there's approximately 2.5 billion people that confess Jesus Christ as the Lord of their life, not living it, but at least confessing it. And after over 2,000 years and 6,553 miles away from Jerusalem, where Jesus first promised that he would build his church and hell wouldn't stop it, you're here in a revolution in Leesburg worshiping this Jesus. That is insane. What are the chances that this could happen? And so if Jesus can pull this off, what about your one thing? What about your one thing? So we can all move forward in confidence when we can look back and see consistency. And when you can see a God whose power and influence transcends circumstance and situation and even death, then you can walk through life with confidence that he'll keep his word to you. You can trust that he'll provide all that you need, right? All that you need if you'll put his kingdom first, central, number one priority. Listen, first and best. That's what Jesus wants. Advancing his kingdom in you and in others. That's what he wants. And if you'll do that first, he will supply all of your needs. And hopefully you can trust God in more things and at deeper levels and maybe even trust Him with your one thing. That's the goal of this message series is that you'll be able to trust God more. And by God's grace, maybe your yes will become yes. And your no will become no. And others will be able to trust you more. And in so doing, this invisible God will become very, very visible to the people around you.